John chapter 8, verse 12. Okay, so far uh, Jesus says in uh, John 6, John 7, and now in John 8, he's going to identify himself in uh, three different ways. He says, I am the bread that came down from heaven in John 6. He said, I am the, uh, I am the, or uh, come, come and, come and, if you come to me, you'll receive living water in John 7. And then I am the light of the world in John 8. And so Jesus identifies himself with three different uh, gifts, the bread, the water, and the life. And those things, and the light of life. And those things uh, harken back, as I mentioned before, to the Exodus, in which they had the light that guided them in the night, they had the water that came out of the rock, and they had the manna that came down out of heaven. And so what Jesus is doing in the book of John is uh, identifying himself as the new Moses. He's leading them on a new Exodus out of a new kind of bondage. And much of John 8 is going to be talking about that. Uh, John 8 contains the passage you're all aware of that says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So John 8 is a passage that is talking about uh, the th themes from the Exodus and trying to show that Jesus was leading them on a new Exodus, a spiritual Exodus, out of bondage to sin into the light of life. And that's where we have uh, John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You get the idea of in the wilderness, uh, they were fleeing Pharaoh, and they took, uh, they, they took 40 years to get to their destination. But during the nighttime, they didn't walk in darkness. They had that light from heaven that was guiding them on the way. And Jesus is saying that he is this light now uh, for the people, that though they would walk in darkness without him, now he's arrived, he's the light of life, and he can lead them safely to where they need to go. This is uh, very similar to what Jesus, rather what was said of Jesus at the beginning of the book in John chapter 1 uh, and verse 4 and 5. He says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So Jesus is this light uh, that's in the world. He's the one that leads us out of darkness, out of sin, out of death, and into life and resurrection. Does anybody have any comments on that? There's a major passage towards the end of the Bible that talks about Jesus being the light. Uh, did, any, did anybody know what that passage is just offhand? Last few chapters of the Bible, to be exact. Uh, in the last few chapters of the Bible, if you recall, uh, Jesus is called the light. Remember that in uh, Revelation 21? Uh, what, was what was interesting about this new city in Revelation 21? What, what? That's right. And so this is Jesus again. And uh, same in chapter 1 of John, same in chapter 8 of John, and same in chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation. Jesus is the light that lights up uh, our lives. He's the light that provides our ability to see uh, for those of us who are in the church. So, in verse 13, the Pharisees, uh, they don't like this too much. They say to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now, Jesus had already given them several witnesses to confirm who he really was. If you think back to John chapter 5, he pointed to uh, John the Baptist, he pointed to God speaking from heaven, he pointed to the signs that he did, and he pointed to uh, the scriptures themselves. And despite all this, they still wouldn't accept him. And so now they've conveniently left all that information out, and they're saying, you're testifying about yourself, your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. Now, in verse 14, uh, Jesus knows that where he came from and that where he's going is the same place, and that's the presence of the Father. Uh, if you recall from uh, John chapter 17, whenever Jesus 
uh, prayed to God there for unity. He said this in verse, uh, in verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself and the glory which I had with you before the world was. So the picture that we have of the cross is fairly uh, straightforward. In Philippians 2, what we find out is that Jesus uh, emptied himself. The scripture says there that he thought that being equal with God was not something to be held on to, was not something to be grasped for. Uh, so Jesus empties himself in Philippians chapter 2. But Philippians 2 goes on to say that because he humbled himself, God lifted him up above every name that was named, so that at his name every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. And this is similar to what's said in John 17. In John 17, we see that because Jesus went to die and because he was resurrected, he was returned, uh, he was returned to the glory that he had with the Father before the world began. And so the picture that we have of Jesus sort of sums up what James says, or rather is a living picture of what James sums up. Humble yourself on the side of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So Jesus says that they did not know where he had come from and where uh, he was going. Uh, they, they thought that they knew God, but they didn't really know God, and that was seen in their actions and how they treated uh, those who they considered to be less knowledgeable than themselves. In verse 15, uh, Jesus says this, You judge according to the flesh. John chapter 8 and verse 15. You judge according to the flesh, that is by outward appearance. I am not judging anyone. Now we saw that earlier in the chapter, didn't we? Because what happened at the beginning of John chapter 8? Who did Jesus interact with? Uh, to start John chapter 8 off in verses 1 through 11. R right, who did, they, uh, who did they bring before him? That's right, and what was his ultimate sentence to her? The very last thing he said to her in verse 10. That's right, neither do I condemn you. Go and... That's right, and then in verse 11 he says, I do not condemn you either, go from now on and sin no more, right? And so Jesus did not act as judge in that situation. He just showed them that they weren't really in a position to be judging her. And this is what he says in verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, That's you judge based on outward uh, appearance. I, he says, am not judging anyone. But, he says in verse 16, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. So, uh, again, he's saying that he might, they might think that he's testifying of himself, but really he has another witness, a supreme witness, and that uh, witness that he has is uh, God himself. Now, they, not, uh, they don't understand this right away, as we're going to see in verse 19, but this is who he is claiming as his ultimate key uh, witness. He says in verse 17, even in, your, even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Again, Jesus already presented several proofs that he was sent from God in John chapter 5. And we already saw in John chapter 3, when talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus reveals that the Pharisees knew that the signs that he were doing must have been from God, because no man can do the things that he was doing unless God was with him. Even in John chapter 11, as we'll see in a few weeks, uh, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it's unmistakable what happened. And so the Pharisees get together, and they have a real big problem with this, because if they don't put a stop to it immediately, then uh, the whole region of Judea would believe in Jesus. So the Pharisees, uh, they saw the legitimacy of the signs that Jesus was performing. But their hearts had become so hard that they weren't willing to really see them uh, and, to, and to accept them. And so Jesus goes on here in verse 17 and 18, and he says that his father was testifying about him, as we just read. And he testified about him through the signs that he performed and through the work uh, that he had given him to do. So now, in verse 19, 
they were saying to him, Where is your father? And Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And these words he said, he, he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So, uh, verses 19 and 20, again, th these are words that would have made uh, these individuals mad, but they didn't take him just yet because it wasn't time for him to be taken. One of the reasons why it wasn't time for him to be taken is because of a prophecy uh, in the Old Testament. If you recall, uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, there is a prophecy there called uh, Daniel's 70 weeks. And when you look at that very last what's called a week, which would be, uh, just to give you the short of it, a, a period of about seven years, because uh, it's one, one day is one year in his prophecy, and it's, uh, so it's 77s, 490 years is the idea. Um, in that last week, you have these seven years and three and a half on one side and three and a half on the other side. And it says that the Messiah would be cut off in the middle of that week, right there. And how long was Jesus' ministry? Yeah, three, just over three years. And so Jesus was crucified right when that Daniel 70 weeks prophecy said that he would be in the midst of the seventh week, in the midst of those last seven years. And then the, the latter seven, the latter three and a half years here, as we've talked about before, make up those 1260 days or so of uh, passages like um, Revelation chapter 11 that talk about the temple being destroyed and things like that. But I just wanted to point that out to you that uh, it, it wasn't Jesus' hour yet. There's still things that he had to do. And part of that was the, was the time constraint on how long his ministry would be. And you see that all the way back in the book of Daniel. So this was something that was seen from uh, long ago. So, uh, verse 20 again, they wanted to take him, they wanted to seize him, but his hour had not yet come. Notice he spoke these words in the treasury as he taught in the temple. So he's standing here where people were collecting up and taking money uh, when he's saying that. and He is offering them uh, a way that was greater than any of the gold that could be contained in the temple. Does anybody have any comments? Because the riches that he was offering far exceeded anything that the riches in the temple could offer. All right, let's look at verse 12, or 21. Got him flip-flop there. Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Now why could they not go to where he was going? They were still in their sin. That's right. That's right. And so what did he say in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus about the kingdom of God and being able to enter it? That's right. Since they weren't born again, born of spirit uh, and born of water, they had no ability to go where Jesus was going into the presence of the Father. And that's how we enter the presence of the Father as well, is by, uh, by being born again. And so he says, you will, I will go away and you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So uh, they try to kind of decide amongst themselves what he's talking about here in verse 22. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them in further uh, explanation, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die uh, in your sins. Now, here in uh, verse 23, to start with, he says, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Jesus said the same thing about his disciples, uh, just to point this out to you. He says in uh, John chapter 17 and verse 6, he says, I've manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. All right? And on down a little bit, he says, uh, uh, on down a little bit, he says, 
O Lord, you. Uh, verse 14, Yet I, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus was not of the world, and he says here in John 8 that he was not of the world. So being not of the world doesn't mean that you floated down from heaven, but being not of the world means that you've been born again. It means that you're a totally different person. It means that you are uh, living in the presence of God. So he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now, look at verse, uh, verse 24. He says, therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, notice the word he in italics there, uh, you will die in your sins. Seems like what Jesus is doing in verse 24 is equating himself with what's said in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. I am uh, sent you, right? And so in saying I am, Jesus is identifying himself with the Father. And uh, they're going to you know, they've been upset by this before in John 5, and they're going to be upset by this a little bit later in John chapter 8 as well, once they start to really catch on to what he's saying. But let's take a look a little bit at this verse 23 once more. He says, you are from below, I am from above. This is a pretty interesting study. Uh, if you were to draw two worlds, uh, one world below and one world above, and maybe put these on a timeline, and maybe put the cross right there, and maybe put the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, let me let me draw this a little bit better. Something like this. Maybe put the fall of Jerusalem there. Maybe put the cross right here. Uh, what you would have is a pretty good picture of what was accomplished through Jesus. This world below is sometimes called this world. In the book of John, sometimes it's called uh, the old heavens and earth. And there's many, other, uh, there's many other things that this world below is called. Whereas this world above will be called the new heavens and new earth. Uh, it would be called the new Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem or the Jerusalem above. Uh, it, it might be called Mount Zion. While this one would be Mount Sinai. Uh, so you have uh, these, this, this idea of the world below versus the world above. I know you can't really read all that. I don't have much room to write, but you get the idea. So we're talking about 1 Thessalonians 4 and being caught up with Christ. It's the idea of being taken out of this world and being put into the world above. Uh, look at what Jesus says in John 17. You, you'll get the idea almost immediately when you when you read this. In uh, John 17, he says, uh, well, there we go. He says this in verse, uh, verse, well, 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 where did it go? I thought I had it highlighted. Okay, verse 11. He says, I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given, uh, given me, that they may be one even as we are. So he says here in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but he says they are in the world. In verse 15, he says this, I, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So, for a time, the saints, even though they were not of this world below, this world down here, they've been born again. He says, I don't want you to take them out of the world. Why do you think that might be? Why would they, why would they need to be not of the world, but remain in the world? Because that world, the new world, hadn't been established yet. Well, that's right. Jesus was going to prepare that place, right? Uh, John 14. Uh, what, what, what did you say, uh, Johnny? That's right. Uh, there were still people that needed to be taught. Imagine what would have happened if Peter would have stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, okay, show's over. You know, No more law. Don't, don't keep these dietary restrictions anymore. No need to be here at this temple. Go back to your homes. You know, Everything's fine. 
who would have listened to him? But as we saw in, uh, as we've seen before, in passages like Acts 21, uh, the Jews were still being zealous of the law, even, you know, several, several years, uh, almost, almost 30 years even, after Jesus had been crucified, uh, even those who had believed. So uh, they had to remain in the world in order to reach the people that were in the world. And so Paul is able to say, with no qualms whatsoever, to the Jew I became a Jew that I may serve the Jews, right? Uh, he had no problem remaining in this world below because he understood that he wasn't of this world. He belonged in this world above. Or as he said in Galatians 4, the Jerusalem above is free. She's the mother of us all. Or as he even said in Galatians 1, uh, that Jesus was going to come to deliver them from the present evil age. So this whole theme of world below versus world above is really uh, fascinating. And even though he just mentions it very so briefly here in John chapter 8, uh, verses 23 and 24, it serves as a uh, really good picture of what, of what that rapture means in 1 Thessalonians 4 that people talk about. Or even looking at Acts 1 and Jesus' ascension into heaven. Jesus' is phys physically going up into heaven was a picture of what had already taken place uh, because of his resurrection. He was already sitting in the heavenly places with Christ, but his ascension uh, was a picture of that. So he says uh, that they are from below, he is from above. Uh, unfortunately, so many people today still seek Jesus in the world below, not in the world above. Uh, they, they look for him to come back and to set up a Jerusalem here on earth, uh, to set up a new temple and a new kingdom in Israel. And because they look for him here, they wouldn't be able to find him. Because Jesus resides in a kingdom not made with hands, a heavenly kingdom. And so, uh, if we want to find Jesus, we better, not, we better stop looking around down here and start looking where God is. And that's where we ought to be as well. So, he says, I said to you in verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They would remain in that world below and perish with that world below, unless they were willing to put their faith in Jesus. So in verse uh, 25, he's, they were saying to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? He had been telling them who he was all along. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. In verse 27. The last time he had spoken openly to them about his relationship with God, what had they done in John 5? They wanted to kill him, right? And uh, this is, you know, he had been healing on the Sabbath day, and they defended it by saying that his father basically made the Sabbath day so he could do what he wanted to do, and uh, they didn't like that too much. So here they don't realize just yet that he's talking about the father. They're still a little bit confused about this. So in verse 28, Jesus said, When you lift the, up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing uh, on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Notice here in John 8, there's no fancy miracles or signs. There's no things that he does to convince people. He just simply speaks truth. And many believe in him because of that. A lot of people uh, are discouraged in Christianity today because they're not able to perform these wonderful signs that Jesus performed. But Jesus convinced many people just by showing them compassion and love and, and speaking honestly and openly with them. And that's what we can use to uh, convince people of these truths as well. But again, he drops this reference to Exodus chapter 3. Uh, you will know that I am. He says, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Why is it that they would know that, that he, who he was whenever they would lift him up? What would happen just shortly after that, three days later? He'd be resurrected. And so they would know who he was because when they lifted him up, uh, when they lifted him up, he'd be right back again just a few days later. And that would be proof that... Uh, he who truly was from God. And this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. If you go back there and read, he says in verse 4 that Jesus was declared 
the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus was declared uh, to be the Son of God through his resurrection. So that's one way that they would know uh, who he really is. Anybody else? Johnny? You know, you were saying that after the resurrection that they would know, but uh, I recall they were saying that they sure they knew that before we lived after, you know, him on the cross. That they, God That's true. That's true. The centurion looked at those signs, and uh, and he knew that he was the son of God at that point, didn't he? Um, the signs that were surrounding the cross, the darkness, the earthquake, the rending of the veil, and the uh, and the resurrection of those saints we read about in Matthew 27, um, they uh, they did serve as many proofs to many individuals that he was the son. So that's right. Those would also be an indication of it. Um, What's interesting is that Matthew 27 does indicate that those that were resurrected in their tombs uh, came out after Jesus' resurrection in Matthew 27. So that's why I said after, because some of those signs took place after the resurrection. But that's right, the darkness and the rending of the veil at the temple would have been clear indicators that, uh, that Jesus was the Son of God. Hey, by the way, while we're on that subject, which veil in the temple was torn? The temple. All right, so uh, go to Hebrews chapter 9 real quick. Hebrews chapter 9. Look, look here at verse, verse 3. He says, uh, Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies. Just pointing out to you that there's, that there's two veils. And so you had uh, two veils. You had one veil that separated uh, the most holy place from the holy place. But then you had another veil that separated where everybody else could go from the holy place. Now think about this. Um, who saw that veil torn, according to Matthew 27? The centurion, right? He said in, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, if you go back and you, and you look, uh, around about verse 51 or so, he said, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks are split. But then he goes on to say, verse 54, uh, now, when the, now the satyrian and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Surely this was the Son of God. So let me ask you a question. How did the centurion see this veil being torn? If he was uh, a Gentile. Is that saying that he saw that? Saw the, t the, the curtain rip? It, well, it's, if it's, you read that, I mean, that, that's like a continuation. It doesn't, I don't, I don't read it again because I don't think it's saying that the, necessarily that the centurion saw that. Well, it could be. That could be. It, it does say that he saw the he earthquake saw and the earthquake things that were happening. And the things that were happening. But that, right. When you go up a little bit, it doesn't, to well, me, it's not saying that he saw. What? It would make him a statement that the, that the curtain was, and then it goes down, down to what actually the centurion was doing and actually saw. Right. Uh, the, well, here, here's, a, here's another thought, just for your consideration. Um, Jesus was crucified on Passover, right? Mm -hmm. And how many people, I mean, were in Passover? Just tons and tons and tons. Mm -hmm. And if this veil was torn here, uh, the the most holy, the veil to the most holy place there. Oh uh, well. The who is the only people that would have been aware of that? The priests. The priests. But if this veil was torn, that led to the holy place, who would have seen that? Everybody. So kind of what I think is, uh, this veil is the one that was torn, because whenever Jesus, uh, whenever Jesus establishes the church. Who's allowed to be a priest at that point? Everyone is followed by all of those priests. That's right. And so this veil, I think, would be torn, which would allow everybody uh, into the holy place in that sense. Uh, whereas this second veil, the most holy place, uh, it would be torn at the fall of Jerusalem because that's whenever God comes down and tabernacles among his people, you see. So it's almost like 
it's almost like the first veil is what everybody would see because uh, everybody saw the darkness and the earthquake and the, uh, the resurrection of those individuals. Uh, that, that was seen by a lot of people. But the rending of the veil to the most holy place would have almost been kept under wraps by the priests, don't you think, if they could help it. But the rending of this veil of the, of the, of the holy place, that would be seen by everybody there who was there to witness the slaying of the Passover lamb and the sacrifices and the preparation of all those things. And this would signify a, uh, a changing of the priesthood. And so when the temple falls, totally, in 70, notice what Hebrews chapter 9 goes on to say, if, if uh, you are still over there. In Hebrews chapter 9, he says uh, in verse uh, 8, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place, uh, talking about that inner area, has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make uh, the worshiper perfect in conscience. But he says that the way into that, that holiest of all would not yet be made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing. So when the temple falls, totally now you have that second veil being torn and uh, the opportunity for everybody to enter into the presence of God so you have the the changing of the priesthood signified by the tearing of the first veil and then the entrance into the presence of God when the second veil is torn so to speak at the fall of Jerusalem uh, indicating that the, the that, it, that, uh, that we are living in truly the temple of God not a big point uh, not something that we could necessarily prove either way, but uh, I would always assumed it was that inner veil as well that was torn. But to me, it makes more sense for the people attending Passover to see that first veil uh, being torn open because that would indicate a transition of the priesthood and the changing of the covenants, which seems to be in line with what we read about in the New Testament. Uh, but again, I'm not going to be, you know, fight you over that. It just seems... It makes sense to me. Um, now, whether or not the centurion can saw that, that was a good point that you brought up. He doesn't specifically say that the centurion saw it, but uh, if he had any chance of seeing any veil uh, being torn, it would have been the one to the holy place from out in the court of the Gentiles. But again, I'm not going to be too strict on that. Um, okay, that's John 8, 12 through 30. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? I don't see any need getting into verse 31 before uh, next week. All right, I'll go ahead and.